Good afternoon. Would you open your Bibles again as we did this morning to John chapter 15 and have that uh, text open before you. John chapter 15 in the first six verses we started looking at this morning. If you want a title, it's part B, I guess, of the Lord's Garden, Abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. And perhaps for the benefit of those who may not have been here this morning, in part one of this study in the Lord's Garden, we observed that Christ is the true vine, the failed vine of the Old Testament, and then secondly, the true vine being perfectly exemplified in the incarnate Son of God. Christ is the true vine, and secondly, observe God the Father is the perfect gardener and vine dresser. He's the one who tends to his church, tends to each one of his own. Number one, we noted the protecting care of the Father. We noted his watchfulness over his vine, pruning and nurturing and nourishing and chastising where necessary, and his faithfulness in that not one will be lost. The scriptures come to us again and again, assuring us that those in Christ, those in the vine, are assured of salvation in Christ. We consider then uh, main point number three by way of application to our souls. The question is, how then should we live? What is our responsibility in the vine to our living head, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true vine, and to the heavenly gardener, our father, the vine dresser, and his watchfulness? And his faithfulness to our souls. How do we respond? How do we remain in him? So third point, main point, number three. To bear fruit, the branches must remain, remain in the vine. Quite simple. It's in the text. To bear fruit, the branches must remain in the vine. And let's read verses four to six together by way of reminder. Jesus repeats again, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that central piece is truly the central piece of everything. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are gathered, thrown into fire and burned. Well, here we come to the primary purpose of Christ's teaching in this chapter, and that is set before us. What is that? What is the purpose of the branches in any tree? To bear fruit. To bear fruit. This can only be done, only be possible, if we abide in Christ. We heard of the foreign vine this morning, the failed vine of Israel, who bore wild grapes. And so we need to abide in the vine. And this is Christian living. And where do we find this? We find this throughout the scriptures that are given to us. And, and different writers of the, of the Bible express it in different way. Paul in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 puts it this way. If then you have been raised with Christ, in other words, if you've been born again, if you are in the vine, seek the things that are above. You have a different mindset. You've got a different life. Seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And Paul, the apostle in Romans chapter 12, a well-known verse also, states that in view of God's mercies, his grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, all those things, the spiritual uh, gifts and heavenly places given to us, explained in the first part of Romans, he comes and says, what is your reasonable response? What's your reasonable service or worship in response to that Simply this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
This is the Christian life. And so our predestination by God in and through Christ realized in our salvation has a clear purpose in mind. The glory of God in our redeemed state. This through our sanctification as evidence of fruit bearing. And so Christ says, you must remain in me. Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us in advance that we should walk in them. And then here in the Gospel of John, John expresses it. Our Lord Jesus Christ, John recording these words, the picture of the vine, the branches, and the vine dresser. Christ simply says to us, abide in me and I in you. This blessed command and promise, the implied warning is clear. Believers can and are distracted from abiding in Christ. And we neglect our duty to bear fruit and to live in him, built up in him. And why is this? Well, it's for a number of reasons which we know. It's the influences of the world in which we live and those distractions. It is our own flesh or our remaining sin. And it is certainly the devil who's at war against God and against our souls. We've also seen today that believers in Christ, in the vine, are secure in the vine. And yet the warning is clear to us. The frequency and the consistency of our fruit bearing waxes and wanes, doesn't it? And as Christ warned, there will be some who no longer bear fruit, even though they bore fruit before. Believers can and do lose their usefulness and their fruitfulness in the gospel. And though in Christ, this passage warns that perhaps they no longer abide in him and have been distracted from those spiritual exercises. Well, Paul in Philippians makes this a little clearer to us. He says the Christian life there, believers are like Farmers and soldiers and athletes. And that too is a warning. Like these professions and skills, they take constant effort and perseverance. And Paul in Philippians goes too far, so far as to say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. And oh, the whole of the New Testament and these writers and these passages we've mentioned are saying the same thing that Christ says to the believer. Abide in me and I in you. So what is our responsibility? As those who are already clean, washed in the blood of the Lamb, redeemed by Christ, grafted into the vine, how do we confirm our faith? How do we make our calling and election sure? By bearing fruit. Abiding Christ and bearing fruit in accordance with repentance. And Christ tells us now, abide in the vine, abide in Christ. So as we come to our responsibility, we have to realize that without him, we can do nothing. We need to abide in Christ. And John chapter 14 has taught us these things. Christ said there, because I live, you also will love. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who love me. It is the very same thing that Christ teaches. Abide in me and I in you. Brothers and sisters, the fruit of the Spirit of God is only possible 
if we remain and abide in him. And what does that mean? It means to abide in his word. With the spirit, when by the spirit we are obedient to the commands of Christ, this is proof. This is proof to the world. This is proof to our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is proof to ourselves that we love Christ and that we are truly in him. How does the gardener or the vine dresser achieve fruit from the branches? Through the vine, yes, through Christ Jesus, his work of the spirit in the believer, the love and the joy and the peace and the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. And Paul says in that text in Galatians, as he summarizes, he says, basically keep in step with the spirit. This is the fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Be in the Spirit. Be in the Word. Abide in Christ. Be in the Word of Christ. The vine dresser will have his fruit. Like my wife, who's that persistent gardener. And she'll cut it back and cut it back and cut it back. And lo and behold, there are flowers in that plant once again. The vine dresser will prune and he will cut back by admonition or affliction, by courage, encouragements of the word. Even through our own sin and failings, he will use that so that we are pruned, so that our works are tested, so that we produce that fruit. And here's a lesson before we even get to the individual points. Brothers and sisters, welcome, welcome the pruning knife of the vine dresser. Welcome the pruning knife of the vine dresser. This is the work of the Spirit through the Word to create more fruit to His glory, to resume bearing fruit when we have wandered from Him, when we have stepped into darkness, when we have sinned, when we've neglected the means that He's given us to abide in him. Praise God for his grace, his faithfulness and his love, for his care as the vine dresser, for the son, for the vine in whom, in whom he causes us to remain in for nourishment and sustenance. If we are in him, we are clean. Remain in him, delight in him, love the means of grace he has given us, that he's given to his church to keep us in him. And a withered, unfruitful branch is ready for the pruning knife. But know this, no matter what your station in life, no matter how much neglect you have given to the means that God has given you, no matter how much you've neglected your own prayer, your own study, and the gathering together with the believers, he will never give up on us. If we are in Christ, he will have his fruit. He will have his fruit. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And praise the Lord that in spite of us and our sin and our slowness to obey and to bear fruit, he will, he promises to bring to completion that work which he begun in each one of us. No matter how bad you know you are, as I know my own heart, as you know your own hearts, and how we neglect these things, neglect to abide in Christ, neglect to walk with Him, neglect to be in His Word, neglect to be in prayer, neglect the means of grace that He's given to us. The psalmist in Psalm 119 asks himself the same question. How shall a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So I want us to ask the question this afternoon. How practically, how can I do this? What are the means at my disposal to keep me abiding in Christ? Well, there's no problem with the vine dresser. He is perfect, the protecting care of the Father, his watchfulness over us, his faithfulness to us, his drawing love to us. What about the vine? The vine is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who died for my sin. He has secured us in him, in the vine, 
at the cost of his lifeblood when he gave up his soul as a ransom for many and he washed us in his blood and he has given us the helper, the Holy Spirit that we saw in our study in John 14 and Jesus himself on top of all this says to us, and I myself will be with you always until the end of the age. What means that it's God given us every means possible. Every means possible. He is the true vine and we are in him if we believe in his name. If we've come in repentance and faith and believed on Christ, we have been born again by his spirit. He has given us all things but we must remain in him we have work to do we have fruit to produce we have good works to exercise and we have to become better worshipers how do we do that you know from our text without him we can do nothing and even this is true. Even this he has given to us. He's given us the means to remain in him. To abide in Christ. That we may bear fruit and be useful in the gospel. And, and I'm sure if I ask you to put, put up your hands today, you'll give me many things. I just want to suggest four to you. And the first is the longest because it is the most important. Just four things that assist us to remain in Christ and abide in him. And number one is one you hear in this church all the time. Why do you, why do you hear that all the time? Because it's most important. The means of grace. The means of grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a one-time experience. God saved me by his grace when I was 13 years old. Indeed, God's grace is supremely displayed in His Son who gave His by His death and resurrection. We are brought from life to death by this undeserved favor. And Jesus reminds His disciples in our text for life and practice, for Christian living and fruitfulness, for usefulness in the gospel. Without Him, we can do nothing. We need a constant supply of God's grace. We need a constant supply of God's grace to increase our faith and to live by that faith and to trust in Christ more and to live for him. That is why we talk about the means of grace the way that God continues to impart his undeserved favor upon us. The Lord has many ways in which he continues to impart his undeserved favor upon us. That we might live for his glory. That we might remain in the vine in him. Bearing fruit in every good work. And to be sanctified in body and soul until he comes when that work at last will be complete perfectly in the fullness of God's grace. Brothers and sisters, the primary means of grace comes to us as the scriptures teach in the Lord Jesus Christ through the church, through God's gifts to the church, the teaching of the ordinances of Christ and the apostles given to the church are the means God has given to increase our faith. Do you want to grow in your faith? Do you want to be showered by God's grace? Then be in the spirit, as Paul said. What does that mean? Come to church. Come to church. Come to church because God has given us the means of grace in the gathered worship of his people. And he continues to impart grace in that way to us. That is why we have the Christian Sabbath and why we commanded to continue the habit of meeting together. These things commanded and given for our benefit. These are the things that increase our faith. Our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. This calls us weekly to abide in Christ. You know what these things are? It's the reading of scripture. 
It's the reading of the Word of God. It's being united in prayer in the church as we did this afternoon. It's the singing of hymns and worship. It's baptism, which we'll witness again next Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Supper, and that's why we, we've introduced it frequently, because this is a means of grace. This is a picture of the gospel to us. This is a promise that Christ is here, and we eat with him, and we feed on him by faith in our hearts. This is a strengthening of our faith. This is the main way. It's through the church that he's given the means of grace as we gather together. And it's attention to the preached word. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That is why we believe in the centrality of preaching always. Because what is the will of God? Your sanctification. And Christ prayed for us. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we give attention to the preaching of the word of God, that the truth of the word of God may be explained, that we may understand the reason and understand the scriptures more carefully and of great importance. God has ordained through the preaching of the word that we come to faith in him. It's by the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to draw sinners to himself. Brothers and sisters, all these things happen in the true fellowship of the saints, the gathered people of God, the means of grace. And I would ask you this afternoon, if you're honest with yourself and you look at your heart and say, how fruitful am I? How do I love my neighbor? How do I love Christ? How do I love his word? How often am I in his word? How often do I pray? How do I love to be together with God's people and you have to say, I'm a withered branch. I'm a withered branch. I bear so little fruit. Abide in the vine. Abide in Christ. Fellowship with Christ in your daily walk starts with the means of grace given to the local church. And I've heard Christians say it over and over again. Sometimes they are not Christians who say that I don't need the church. When I play golf, I commune with God. <laughs> There's no grace on the golf course. Grace is given in the means that God has provided. The reading of scripture, in the preached word, in the prayers of the saints, in the singing of hymns, in the preaching of the gospel. Do you want God's grace abundantly poured upon you week after week to give you strength for your Christian walk so that you will be fruitful for him, so that people will see that there is a Christian, he's full of love and joy and peace and patience. And get what? guess what? He's afflicted and he's brought low, but he abides in the vine. Why? Because of the means of grace. Don't fool yourself. We need each other. And that's why some people add to the means of grace the fellowship of the saints. But I say it is the fellowship of the saints that constitutes all of these blessed means of grace. How can I grow? How can I produce fruit? Come and attend to the means of grace. God has made it that simple. And that's where we spend most of our time because it kind of covers everything. But I have three more. Number two, avail yourself of the means of grace. Secondly, Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. The means of grace and the blessings of the gathered believers. But there's Monday morning. And there's temptations. And there's difficulties at work. And there's infirmities. And First Peter 1.15 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Purity of heart. That is a fruit that you have to bear. As a believer, purity of heart and life begins with the acknowledgement of our sin. And First John says exactly that. If we say we have no sin, we fool ourselves. It's a joke. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all our sin. This is fruitfulness. The ongoing practice of repenting of our sin, confessing our sin, putting off our sin like a cloak, and putting it to death, stabbing it and saying, I'm done with that sin. And tomorrow morning, 
we start again and we confess our sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins. Second Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. How do I abide in the vine? Keep yourselves pure. Thirdly, through trials and afflictions. Trials and afflictions. The scriptures teach us very clearly that trials and afflictions are a part of learning to abide in Christ. For though difficult and painful, these teach us dependence upon Christ. These Christ uses to strengthen our faith, to prune those useless branches that have stopped bearing fruit, trials and afflictions. James teaches, lead the man of God to become mature and complete, not lacking in anything. First Peter again, chapter 1 and verse 7, and, and Pastor Sam has touched on this, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, perishes though tested by fire, that perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus will use even our afflictions and our trials to keep us abiding in him. Take hold of those means. Take hold of this means in place of discontentment and grumbling at your infirmities and your trials. Use them as God intended, as a reason for joy, for they too are a reason for joy. They too are a means of grace to strengthen our faith. And they teach us to abide in Christ in spite of difficulty. They are a testing and the refining of our faith. This is the work of the vine dresser. In Psalm 119, verse 67 and 71, speak so clearly to this. Just listen. It's Psalm 119, 67, and then 71. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. How our afflictions are used to keep us in the vine in Christ. In verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So afflictions and trials is another way in which we can abide in the vine. Fourthly and finally, and with this I close, simply the advice of the Lord Jesus Christ from the previous chapter. The heading is trust in God, trust also in Christ, look for and long for his appearing. Was this not the message that he gave to his troubled disciples in John 14? Above all, let not your hearts be troubled, but what? Believe in God. Believe also in me. In other words, trust in Christ. Trust in Christ and Christ alone. Trust in God and in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it puts all of our trials, all of our difficulties, all of our doubts and our failures into perspective. Believe in God, believe also in me. That him goes, the heart of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. And Christ summarizes this beautifully. Believe in God, believe also in me. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, Lest it abides in the vine, neither can you, lest you abide in me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are the perfect vine dresser who watches over our souls and trims us and prunes us and sanctifies us by your Spirit how we thank you for the vine, our Lord Jesus Christ, who we remember in a moment as we gather around his table, remember his suffering and his death for us, that we might be in him today. 
Lord Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, help us to remain in you, for you remain in us. We belong to you, for you purchased us with your precious blood. Help us to avail ourselves of the many means that you've given us, that we might be fruitful, that we might be useful in the gospel as we abide in Christ and cause us to look for and long for your appearing as you continue to sanctify us by thy truth, for thy word is truth. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen.